All right. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our, our next panel, which um, is on a landscape of opportunities, a European perspective on VC investing. It's going to be moderated by Mercedes Storch, who is the head of international relations for Access ICO, which is um, a, publicly, a public investment company here in Spain. Um, and then she's joined by a panel of people with different perspectives on investment in Europe. I'll let her go ahead and make those introductions. <laughs> Hello, yeah. good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for staying because it's more or less lunch time, so it's not so easy. And when I asked for a warm audience, I was thinking about another thing. <laughs> uh, I, really, I was a little bit disappointed yesterday when I realized that I wasn't in the room with the rock band. But we have here some rock stars for the venture capital. So uh, we are quite lucky and we are going to understand a little bit about who is the, is the landscape. In nowadays, in venture capital, we have different jurisdictions and we have uh, the EIF that in always give this global view that is so valuable. So I will introduce a little bit uh, the, the panelists. We have uh, Ian Mars. I, I put a headline for every CV and yours is the FinTech man. He joined uh, DN Capital in 2017. He focused in the UK market as well as e-commerce, FinTech and software. Prior, he was a um, CEO of HelloFresh and led the UK operation of Rocket Internet. Internet. Uh, previously, he worked in the deal team of Bain Capital Europe, and he started his career in strategy consulting, uh, both in McKinsey in Madrid and in Bain, Bain and Co. in London. And Ian works in, in DN, DN Capital, that is a globally early stage venture firm who invests in seed, series A, and growth stage business. Maybe you can add something about uh, in which moment you are now. I have to congratulate you because uh, yesterday I, I, I read that you led the $25 um, a million dollar round, the largest uh, series A in Spain, fundraised by, uh, by B Next. Yeah, <laughs> so it's a, it's a brave decision, but um, we just led the round in, in BNEX, and it's, you know, it's got an incredible metrics. It's a neobank, which is showing the same <coughs> early stage growth as, say, Monzo, Revolut, and N26 did. Um, very impressive founder, and, and hopefully going to take it to Latin America, which is still very underpenetrated outside of Brazil in terms of neobanking. So that, that's, that's the plan. Uh, hopefully, we can execute on it. Yes. Then we have Sebastian, that it was really a challenge because he has long experience private equity, real estate, and venture capital. Over 22 years of experience in private equity, real estate, venture capital. He founded uh, Wonder House in 2015, providing flexible community and hazing co-living opportunities for young professionals and students. Has been also director of platforms, Nido Students Housing, and DB Deutschland Property Partners. Also 11 years in private equity in London, Frankfurt, with uh, many different positions. He works for Joint Capital, a venture firm focused in early stage investment, B2B, industry sectors. Uh, using the micro multinational approach for market leadership, they try to support local teams who are developing and scaling differentiated products in a capital efficient way. Uh, maybe you want to mention something else about your fund? Yes, gracias, Mercedes. So basically, we're a first time fund, so any entrepreneurs out here, we feel with you in regards to fundraising. Um, and I can't tell you when it's a good time. It's, it's, it's always a, a difficult time. Uh, we, we founded JOIN in 2015, um, basically to address the Neue Industrie. Um, what do I mean by Neue Industrie? Is that we're focusing purely on B2B platforms um, in prop tech, um, machine automation, um, and enterprise SaaS, and what we put together is a, currently a 60 million um, fund with zero public money. So we only have private money from large German um, Mittelstand companies. So Germany has a, a quite a big piece of the pie of the GDP in Europe of 550 million people for, for Europe. And what we do is we invest throughout Europe. We have investments in eight European countries from Portugal, Spain, Holland, Belgium, France, Switzerland, UK. We don't see any boundaries as you maybe did in 2000, 2001, 2003. Things are being standardized. You're finding great human capital 
um, throughout Europe, and I think there's a huge opportunity um, for Europe in the next um, 10 years. And thank you for being here. Okay, thank you, Vaseline. Then we have Pauline Oru. Uh, she works for Elia Partner. She's the multitask techie. She began his, her career in equity research analysts uh, at Credit Agricole and Genesta Finance. Uh, then she has been working in investment banking in corporate finance team of Brian Garner and Co. And she executed a dozen of NMA fundraising IPOS transaction for the tech sector. Apart from this, she is working also for the Venture Council of Invest Europe, give classes at France Invest, and is a mentor at several tech accelerator programs in Paris. She works for Elaya, that is the leading European digital and deep tech venture capital firm. Uh, some figures are um, Elaya has 350 million under management, uh, plus than 60 investment and 19 exits. If you want to explain us. Yes, very quickly. Uh, the, the focus of the of investing we, we have at Elaya is a really tech disruption. So we mainly invest in in early stage in B2B companies with tech differentiation. So we hear a lot at the moment uh, about deep tech or things about uh, AI around machine learning as well. So this is the type of, uh, of space we, we like and we invest ticket ranging from one to five million and then we we continue to support companies over the road. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then Antoine Nassenbaum, I think, <laughs> from Felix Capital. Antoine is partner and member of the founding team of Felix Capital. He previously was a partner at Atlas Global, a private equity fund origin originally part of GLG Partners. Also, he worked closely with uh, various early stage digital startups and he was also part of ABN Amor at Investment Banker. He co-founded Felix Capital in 2015, a venture capital for the creative class at the intersection of technology and creativity, focused on opportunities in the digital style life. Uh, anything you want to add about your investments? Um, yeah, we, we're a young venture firm. We launched in 2015. Uh, we have now 300 million dollars under management, investing with our second fund. So we invest with a thematic uh, focus around shifting consumer behaviors, which are empowered through, through the digital. Uh, both on the B2C side, so any new branded proposition we see in the market coming, either through products, platforms, or, or services. Uh, and we also invest in softwares that helps uh, retailers and brands to improve their relationship, the experience with the customers. Um, yeah, it's a... That's about it. Some of our recent uh, successes were Farfetch, uh, Peloton, Deliveroo, uh, amongst others. And last but not least, we have uh, Oscar Fares. He, he works for the EIF. He started in, in some Spanish venture capitals like uh, Caixa Capital Risk and Dabeake Venture Capital. Uh, nowadays, he's the head of unit in, uh, in the inno innovation at the, and technology investment team at the European Investment Fund. That is the institution that provides risk finance to benefit a small and medium-sized enterprises across Europe. Uh, then the, the figures about the EIF are very big, like uh, more than 300 uh, venture capital funds invested, uh, 4,000 uh, companies in their portfolio, so uh, they have a very good uh, view of what is happening, uh, where uh, there is investment, so maybe you can give us uh, today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and basically, we are the largest uh, investor in European venture capital. Uh, we support f funds across Europe. And just also additionally to those figures, we uh, commit every year approximately 1.7 billion euros to around 100 uh, venture capital funds from uh, scaling up and fueling the, the ecosystem. We were investing just 700 million uh, a year in around 30 funds just uh, five years ago. So doubling our, our bet for a uh, European venture. I would uh, like to start with Ian, uh, because uh, as you have invested in more than 14 countries and maybe others can add uh, later, but I would like to know because valuation is something very sensitive uh, some European venture capitals are saying that the prices are quite crazy nowadays here, but if you compare it to the States, uh, really 
they are not so large. Yeah, um, so we, we have an office in Menlo Park, and then we, based out of London, we cover about nine European geographies. So we see deals from across Europe and the US, and it leads to some quite amusing conversations at investment committee around, around relative valuations. I mean, US is definitely often higher, but half of that's just loads of capital, higher valuations. We have to understand that it's a crazily large, unified consumer market. So the, the ability to put outside returns in the US is still far greater, I think, than Europe. So if you know, I used to run a company called HelloFresh, a meal kit company. My, my P&L was the largest in Europe. We got a 100 million turnover. We launched the US three years later. And you know, I'd ring up my US uh, kind of compatriot, sort of co-founder equivalent, and I was spending half a million on marketing and tapping out on market size for the UK. He was spending six million on marketing a month. So that's just the relative scale. So I do think part of that differential is justified. And then within Europe, there's, huge, there's actually increasingly large differences. So I think, in some ways, the top end of the market for London, Berlin, and actually, you can talk about France, but France has got quite, quite expensive as well, is, is almost near the US and some of the more emerging European economies. So we've done three deals now in Spain. Spain, you know, I think on average, the prices are more reasonable. But what I think you have to understand is, you know, it's an increasing trend for international investors to come here. There are big fundraisers, but there's still probably, on average, the valuations aren't as toppy as Berlin, Stockholm, London. But the follow-on rounds, so, you know, where is the Series A? The Series B guys, Series C guys, aren't yet going to probably, they're going to probably put it some discount. You know, they don't know the geography. They don't have loads of investments here. They don't know about the exits. The, the IPO route's still not proven here. So... You can't just come in as an investor going, oh, this looks cheap versus benchmarks versus the equivalent UK, German companies. You have to think about the next round, the round after that. Um, and then last, I think, for Spanish companies, right, the way to really raise your valuation is, is don't just be domestic. I think what I'm very excited about for Spain, say, versus something like Italy is you have access to all of Europe, but you also have access to all of Latin America. And, and that duality and that size of market you can get to and then also, if you can crack Latin America, the U.S. funds that will potentially deploy cash in the following rounds can mean you can dramatically increase your valuation. But I think if you stay domestic, it's, it's, it's quite hard to raise money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just maybe, maybe to add on this debate on valuations, we did some, some numbers uh, for our VC conference last week in, in Luxembourg where we analyze the capital efficiency as well of um, very European unicorns yeah. versus U.S. Uh, unicorns. On that side, and despite the growing concerns in Europe about, about valuations, we are still, with the data we have, uh, more efficient in Europe in terms of, uh, for each euro invested, the amount of value we create in the startup company. And so just to give you uh, uh, um, uh, the highlights, in, in Europe, uh, when a company turns into a unicorn, basically for each euro that is invested into a company, there, is, there are four euros of value created, so it's a 4x multiple on cost. In the US, it's around 3.4 at the time of graduation of the unicorn. But the most interesting data is at the time of the exit of the unicorn, and probably still the data set for Europe is a bit reduced. But the multiple on for each euro invested in a unicorn at the time of exit in Europe, value credit is a bit lower than 8x, so 7.8x, whereas in the US is 2.7x. So, I mean, again, capital efficiency for European companies is, is much higher than, uh, than for the US, um, which is just another dimension to, to the whole debate on valuations, but I think it, it, it was interesting to share. Maybe if I can add up on you, Oscar, because I really like the statistics mm -hmm. and, and then it's a good argument to bring more money in Europe rather than in the US. Um, I think also part of the, of the reasons is that US historically has been more focused or at least has got much more success in B2B companies, which are also much more capital effective than B2C ones. Um, we have, of course, a few logos of very, very iconic uh, B2C companies in Europe, but much less than in the US, of course, because of the market size uh, and also because maybe of the, of the DNA of the investors here. But B2B companies with tech assets and, and IP uh, are also much less capital, uh, capital consuming. So, so this capital efficiency is also due to the type of deal flow mm -hmm. and the type of companies we are good at growing here, I think. Yes, so we are going to move a little bit. Uh, Sebastian, in, in 
in the recent, recent years, we have seen that uh, the growth of, of farm raising is much higher than the, 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 the speed of investment. Do you think that the, this trend is going to continue with the uncertainty about the growth in the coming years? So um, basically, yes, you're, you're correct. I mean, globally, I think KPMG published that around 350 billion was invested um, in 2018. Um, if you split it between Asia, Europe, and the US, and um, I'd, I'd like to focus on Europe, so being in Europe, despite the accent, um, basically I see a huge opportunity because we lag um, immensely in deal numbers despite being 550 million compared to 320 million population, um, we have maybe 4,000 deals um, a year while they have um, about 14,000 deals a year. So I think um, you, you might be seeing, um, let's say, concentration of assets in mega funds. I mean, f take Felix, it started in 2015, already managing over 300 million. That's incredibly impressive. Of course, two funds. <laughs> They're still good. <laughs> I'm still on number one. Um, um, so I, I think, I think. I mean, I, I was in venture at Schroeder Ventures in 98, where venture capital was um, basically shareholder loans with um, triggers um, to take over the equity. Um, and, and I think the market has gone an inc incredible long way. But being behind the, the, the US gives us the benefit of, of relooking of uh, the industry. I think um, right now Europe is lagging very much behind on institutional money. Um, in Germany alone, very few of the institutions invest into um, venture capital. I don't know what the number is in Spain. I mean, you have Telefonic and everywhere here. Let's see how much their pension funds put in the Spanish venture capital market. And I think that's a very important um, role for us all um, to help these pensions understand that venture is a 10, 20 year um, perspective that we um, are not um, sort of affected by two, three year dips um, in, 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 in economies or recession because we're looking at the long term. Yes, as Ian said, you have cyclicality in multiples. Um, so it's, it's harder if, if you maybe get that one wrong. Um, but if you're looking at the long term, I think it averages us out. So I'm not too worried about that. And I think Europe has this huge opportunity to, to grow this market. I, I agree with the B2B um, angle. I mean, we just do B2B. And what we try to do is, is, is give these non-German companies um, a commercialization access to the German Mittelstand because they're very risk averse, these large manufacturing companies. If they have to suddenly put a module on some CNC machine mm -hmm. or extrusion, um, intrusion plastic machine, they, they, they will not do it. They will, they will wait until the last moment um, to improve the efficiencies in their structure. So I think even um, a dip, as, as you mentioned before, would actually help the, 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 the European economy wake up and, and, and embrace um, the efficiency of the, of the product. Mm -hmm. And now, Antoine, I would will, I will like to know, how do you compete with those uh, US investors that are now leading some rounds that are approaching our, our market? And how do you see this, this competence? Yeah, I mean, I think we all have seen uh, the last couple of years a uh, big rise of, uh, of US investors and, and, and top quality US investors from both the, both the East Coast, the West Coast, coming into Europe, investing in Spain, uh, with, with Spark uh, in Travelberg, and, 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 and of course France, of course Germany, and UK, everywhere. Mm -hmm. I even heard that some of them are thinking to set up European vehicles uh, dedicated to Europe, so with people on the ground. So it's definitely happening. It would be interesting to understand if it's, uh, if it's a result of having a very strong uh, uh, conviction on Europe, also being uh, somehow a bit, uh, having US a bit too competitive and too heated. So it might, it might transfer the problem of valuation from Europe, from US to Europe, and I, I wouldn't say it might, it's happening somehow uh, with larger ticket. I, I think it, uh, it's actually very good to a certain extent because um, uh, I, I think somehow we have a gap a bit around more of a, the growth, the Series B, Series C uh, type of stage in Europe, Series D. N not so much from the entrepreneur's ambition, actually, which used to be the problem, but actually I would blame ourselves as investors, European investors, sometimes I'd get a bit more risk adverse towards these rounds where actually 
it's time to push, it's time to think internet association, it's time to go for it. <laughs> and, and I think having these guys in the mix are actually gonna help uh, fulfill the kind of uh, ambition entrepreneurs have now uh, across Europe. And uh, selfishly, us as a firm, we, because of our thematic angle, we, we like to work with these firms, we like to work with you, other European firms, so for us it's about staying focused on our themes, staying focused on our relevancy uh, in, in the themes we go after and convince entrepreneurs that we can, and these investors, that we can, we can work alongside them. Mm -hmm. So uh, following with this uh, topic really about Series B, uh, how there is a lack of, of funding in, in this uh, area, I would like to know the opinion of Pauline, uh, because uh, you have more than 19 exits, so, and you have a huge portfolio. So you, what is your view about uh, how, how it works? Uh, clearly, we are experiencing the past five to 10 years a, a lack of a growth stage funding in, in, in Europe. Uh, in France and in Europe. Um, this is clearly something that is changing uh, in two ways. First one is that the traditional incumbents from the PE industry uh, that were not much in technology and in innovation and more traditional businesses are coming to this space uh, with uh, you know, a lot of, uh, of envy to, to, to go into this market. Uh, so this is first thing. Second one is that um, a lot more money is now being dedicated to, 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 to grow uh, the asset under management from the, from the GPs to cover uh, this specific area in Series C and afterwards. Uh, last week, President Macron uh, announced a 5 billion envelope uh, specifically dedicated to growth stage with the nice target of having 20, 25 unicorns in a, in a couple of years, which is quite challenging, so we will need to, to work hard. <laughs> um, but I think it's not on, only a matter of, uh, of growth funding, it's also a matter of, of exit. It means that we need to have a full financing uh, road that is consistent. Uh, and this road ends with exits, uh, either public listing or trade sale. And at the moment, uh, clearly Europe is underperforming in this. Uh, public markets in, in Euronext are clearly in Europe not the same as in the US. Um, it's not like a, a chance that a, a lot of companies, uh, tech companies, go, go public uh, on the NASDAQ instead of Paris or, or London. So we need to have a more asset manager, more equity research analysts that understand those business, which are quite different from what they know. And we also need some corporates to, to buy our companies with a, the same type of returns we may have in the US. Um, so it's a lot of uh, ecosystem uh, um, education, maturity. I think it, it's, a, it's going better and better and faster and faster as well. Um, on our end, to be very honest, we haven't suffered that much about the growth funding and, and the exits because since we are very focused on, on IP comp IP tech companies, uh, most of them at Series B and C go and fund themselves in the US because most of the exits are in the US. Um, 20 exits is not enough to, to, to have a, a full sample, but at least it, uh, it, it's kind of meaningful. We, are, we have around two thirds of our exits in the US, either public listing or uh, uh, trade sale and acquisitions. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Oscar, we are almost run out of time, but uh, please give <laughs> us a brief view about the performance of, of European venture capital. If you want to add anything, or I I which yeah. are the main hubs no, in Europe? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I fully support all the arguments that have been shared here about European adventure. Maybe very quickly on, on the um, allocation of private institutional investors to better, really, we have a, a real issue there. Our numbers show that even in, uh, in developed markets, one third of the funding that goes into VC funds is public funding. Um, in emerging geographies, Central Eastern Europe, uh, Portugal, it's, uh, it's two thirds or even 70% public money into VC funds. I mean, that's not sustainable in the long term, but uh, we, we need to make an effort to, to bring pension funds into the, uh, into the asset class. In terms of performance, we are living, uh, I would say, uh, a rosy moment in, uh, in Europe. If we analyze our portfolio from, of VC funds from 2000 to the latest VC fund we have invested in, it's about 200 funds. The top 50, top 50 funds, so the first 
50, 50 funds in our portfolio have returns above 20%, 20% IRR. That's, I mean, there's still a lot, of, a lot of unrealized value. So again, with the exits, we, we need to confirm the good moment of European venture. But uh, clearly, the returns are at least at par with, uh, with US. In US, you might have more outliers in, uh, in VC funds. But if we compare top quartile returns from European funds to US funds, since 2009, we're starting to be uh, at par with the US. So I think it's, it's a very good moment to put money into the, into the asset class. So if there is any institutional investor here, please uh, invest in, <laughs> in all those funds uh, for sure. <laughs> Yes, I invite you to office. all the <laughs> entrepreneurs to go there, investors also uh, go there, because we are uh, here for this today. Thank you so much for coming, for taking the effort, for taking planes, for coming to Madrid. And please join me in an applause to this panel. <laughs>